A physicist has made a case that the symbols on pillars found at the archaeological site of Gobekli Tepe represent constellations, an early form of the zodiac. In today's video, we're going to look at the evidence and see if this theory has legs. The research for this video has been so much fun for me. Not only did I get to exchange a lot of emails with Dr. Martin Sweatman, which has been, I mean, dude, he's published freaking scientist on Netflix and shit, author, and I, I'm Dan, the old electrician. That's been just awesome. But on top of that, Every single paper that I've looked into, well, almost every paper that's involved in the research has been archaeoastronomy. Oh man, it's just so great. I could just eat that shit up all day long. So it's it's been the, the research for this has been great. This is this has been like like this delicious cake that I get to eat bite after bite of. But the best part is the buttery sweet icing on top. Give you three guesses what flavor that is. Hello and welcome back to Debunking. You know, this has been one of my most requested videos to defend Dr. Martin Sweatman's paper against Dr. David Miano's attacks. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, even though I love archaeoastronomy a lot, as I've mentioned before, I took like eight years kind of out of looking at this stuff because I got custody of my son and, and he needed attended to. He's a teenager now and wants me to just get the hell out of his way, so I have plenty of time for these kind of things now compared to before. <laughs> but, so I wasn't really aware of the What Does the Fox Say paper until I saw it on Netflix. And to be honest with you, um, Graham Hancock didn't sell me on it. Um, by whoever decided not to put in the fact that that's a peer-reviewed published work, that, that, to me, that would have changed my view on it considerably because I do have some understanding of archaeoastronomy and like the numbers, the maths that they're going to make something like that jump through those kinds of hoops. So anyway, this is one of the rare cases where I'm actually going to dig my heels in and defend almost every aspect of his paper that we go through because it's damn good. I, I know a lot of you expect me to just to be like, oh, this is ridiculous and stuff. And Dan's normally really skeptical about things. And I am. I'll explain it as we go along rather than giving you a big spiel here. Let's just jump into it. According to the claim that we're looking at today, the symbols on one of the pillars at the site, Pillar 43, not only represent constellations, but also indicate a date which the makers of the pillar recorded. The promulgator of this hypothesis, Dr. Martin Sweatman, wrote a book about this called Prehistory Decoded, some articles, and he has a YouTube channel and website. I hope he responds so that we can have a back and forth on this. So far, none of the makers of the various videos I've critiqued have responded, but I think there's a greater chance that Dr. Sweatman will. Not only is he an academic, and academics are usually inclined to defend their work, but I've had conversations with him on Twitter, both publicly and by private message. So maybe we'll get a public video discussion going. That would be cool. Oh, people don't respond to you when you make videos about them? Yeah, I haven't had that problem at all. Dr. David Miano, who I've made two videos about, who has responded to both of them with the two letters of OK. But that's all right. What kind of bugs me is me asking you what your position is on archaeoastronomy and Dr. Sweatman's paper, but you don't respond. But, you know, whatever. I'll just assume that you think archaeoastronomy is valid and that Dr. Sweatman's paper is particularly egregious and we'll just take it that that is your position and, and you can just tell me later that that was the wrong position and just shift the goalposts and, you know. Is that conducive to making, like, you know, communication between us? Does that make you want to respond to me? No? Huh. This is one of the things right out the gate that's a problem. It's like social media has infiltrated not just regular life, it's infiltrated science. And here we have a published scientist who's got 20 plus years of published freaking works. And then we got another guy who is a YouTube scientist. He's a science popularizer. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love Carl Sagan, for example. There's nothing wrong with a po freaking po science popularizer. The problem comes when you kind of bypass scientific methodology and start using influencer style arguments. I mean, Dr. Sweatman publishes a science paper, writes a book, and then comes onto YouTube to promote his book. Dr. Miano doesn't attack the paper itself through the normal academic channels. He comes to YouTube and attacks it here, where he can use different tactics of winning over the crowd and can poke at him emotionally and Play all manner of games that you could never do in a normal paper. Allow me to read from something really quick. 
The rise of the internet, and especially social media, has offered scientists an easy and powerful route to publicizing their ideas. Yet with great power must come great responsibility. We scientists must be careful not to ruin our shared endeavor through misuse of such channels. The ad hominem attack especially can be damaging. When exponentially magnified by multitudes of likes and retweets, it can become a form of bullying that do serious harm to reputations, careers, families, mental health, and ultimately lives. If ad hominems were normalized, true scientific debate could be drowned out by the clamor of increasingly bitter personal attacks. Dr. Sweatman sent me that paper himself because he is, finds it important that this is portrayed, that this is expressed, because he did not want to continue the discourse with Dr. Miano because of this kind of crap. So as we go forward, I want you to pay attention that it's not... Dr. Miano isn't just criticizing this scientifically. He, he starts the digs, and by the time I get to Dr. Miano's second video responding to Dr. Sweatman, it will be clear that the ad hominems are like a repeated part of his toolbox against Dr. Sweatman. And it's no wonder that Dr. Sweatman has no desire to play that game. It's no place for an academic, to be honest with you. It's underhanded. I mean, the man comes in there and he's like, okay, we're going to do this by the books and by the numbers. And Dr. Miano kind of goes, Poom. it's no place for an academic. It's, it's a place for a construction worker. He did a five-part video series, which is based on his articles and on his book, Prehistory Decoded. I'm going to focus on his first and fifth videos because they deal directly with the issue of the appearance of the constellations of the zodiac at Gobekli Tepe, and more generally, the larger group of Greco-Roman constellations, of which the zodiac is a small part. See what I mean? He's not responding to the paper. He's responding to the YouTube videos. We are in YouTube video response land. We are well away from the place where most academics feel comfortable especially a guy who's been publishing papers for 20 fucking years. He's not used to playing YouTube games to defend his work. And if Dr. Miano had the credentials and or a friend or two that had the proper credentials, he could actually publish a paper that would challenge this. But I don't think that he's equipped to do so. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm a scientist at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and in this series of videos, I'm going to show you how um, we discovered a very ancient zodiac. You may be curious what kind of scientist Martin Sweatman is. He's a chemical engineer with a PhD in physics. That expertise doesn't really come into play in this hypothesis, but he does put his general knowledge of scientific principles to use, not so much in the formulation of his hypothesis, but in the defense of it. As I've said before, I've been asked to respond to this numerous times, and when I sat down to watch it, I was amazed when I got to this part, because normally Dr. Miano's on his game. But this told me right away he had no clue about archaeoastronomy. Yes, Dr. Sweatman being a theoretical physicist, mind you, not just a regular physicist, Dr. Sweatman being a theoretical physicist has very little to do with his formulation of the hypothesis. It has everything to do with his testing of the hypothesis. We'll talk about this really quickly. Um, he's a chemical engineer, right? The, the man who really put archaeoastronomy on the map, as far as in academia goes, Alexander Tom was an engineer, okay? He was the guy who started this shit, basically, as far as an academic side of things. He's the one who took it from a hobby for rich hippies and made it an actual scientific branch of study. Now, I've mentioned Alexander Tom before. Now, there's another paper that I've cited before, and when I've talked about Malta and the serious correlation, and when I've discussed that I don't think the serious correlation is accurate, we actually looks more like it's oriented towards crux. And that paper was co-authored by three individuals. One of them is Dr. Michael Hoskin. He was the founder of the Journal of the History of Astronomy. He recently passed away and he had a PhD in algebraic geometry. That was the reason he was there. Ask yourself a question really quick. What does a theoretical physicist do? They make models of reality using mathematics, generally speaking, because the things can't be observed, like a black hole or, in Dr. Sweatman's case, chemicals that you can't always look at. Who better to bring into something where we have people like Stefan Milo, for example, saying there's absolutely no way we can know this. There's absolutely no way we can know what's going on on the other side of the galaxy, right? Until theoretical physicists bring their maths to bear. <sighs> This is Pillar 43, probably the most important artifact, or ancient artifact in the whole world. It's essentially our Rosetta Stone. This is the, the artifact that allowed us to decode 
Gebekli Tepe. You can see it's carved intricately with these various animal symbols. And there are these handbag symbols at the top. We'll see what they actually are later. Probably, if we can decode those animal symbols, then we can understand what Gebekli Tepe is all about. You see the animal symbols, they don't appear to be random patterns. They appear to be encoding some kind of information. They appear to be telling a story. I think we can all agree that the animals were not placed here randomly or in random patterns. There no doubt was thought put into the depictions. I don't see any indications that they're telling a story. In that case, I would expect to see content linking the various images together in an obvious order. I also don't see what is indicating to Dr. Swetman that they represent a code. Random patterns and code are not our only two choices of interpretation. Theories that have already been suggested, both for these images and for other animal representations, such as in cave art, include that they were used in a mystical way to improve future hunting success, or that they were used for shamanistic ritual. We know the nearby Natufian culture used animal remains in their shamanistic practices. That being said, I think it's entirely possible that these animal images could represent constellations. It makes sense to me. And as they are here at a sacred area, I definitely can see people of this place seeing the constellations as gods, animal gods in this case. I don't know this for sure, but I see it as a valid possibility. Now the idea that it may not be a code or anything like that is a valid perspective. But the idea that it might be for like hunting rituals? Oh yeah, the buzzard hunting and scorpion hunting cults were especially large in Turkey in those days, right? I remember the big old, what the hell are you talking about, man? Come on, that doesn't make no sense. You bring that up because, oh well, it's what they talk about with cave art, but I do not think that there's very many archaeologists out there saying that Pillar 43, Scorpion, and Vulture are about hunting. But I want to point out a couple of things about archaeoastronomy. You know, like there's a paper that I was recently reading that I'll link down below that it's, it's like a field guide for uh, archaeologists. And, and let me read from it real quick. Considering that half the experienced environment around us consists of the sky, to ignore its importance to past societies is to ignore a large area of crucial evidence. The sun, moon, planets, and stars would all form part of the daily life of prehistoric peoples just as they do in indigenous cultures today. The rising of the sun, the changing of the seasons are still associated with ritual activities, as evidenced with ethnographic studies across the world, and there is no reason to suggest they were not similarly ritualized in the past. Not only does it offer you a different lens of interpreting the same evidence, it also offers you routes of new evidence by another paper that I will link down below. Archaeoastronomy has, however, a substantial difference when compared to other archaeology subsidiary sciences for those who can tell us when and how an artifact was produced, where its material comes from, what its builders ate, what animals they bred, etc. These are all very useful information, but only archaeoastronomy could give us an indication about why the artifact was created and information about the symbolic world of those who built it. The usefulness of archaeoastronomy is thus unquestionable and its credibility within the scientific community is steadily increasing. You take a look at the pillar. It does seem laid out in a manner where asterisms seem like a pretty good possibility, a pretty good starting point for a hypothesis. Better than the hunting scorpion hypothesis, I would posit. So this is where I came in. Now, I'm not an archaeologist, but together with my um, colleague, Demetrius Sakritsis, who was a PhD student at the time, we managed to decode these animal symbols. At so we were able to understand the origin of civilization, essentially. Wow, this is quite a claim. Figuring out the meaning of the animal symbols enabled them essentially to understand the origin of civilization? This is the first academic whom I've heard in my entire life that has made that claim. And I've read a lot of books. Dr. Swetman is unabashedly placing himself at the top of the top. Scholars usually are wary of making overreaching assertions like this. Understanding the limitations of the knowledge we have and our own individual limitations, it's wiser to be modest. We may end up being embarrassed later on. So Dr. Sweatman publishes a paper and then writes a book and then goes to publicize the book on YouTube. In publicizing the book, he uses a term which, this is Google Scholar, you can see that using Gobekli Tepe and Origins of Civilization actually yields numerous results because it is considered to be 
What are the origins of civilization at this time? We focused on Pillar 43. That's the, the key to understanding Gebekli Tepe and therefore the key to understanding the origin of civilization. So he uses a touch of hyperbole to promote his book, but rather than recognize that as advertising like anybody should, Dr. Miano decides to attack that and to go after Dr. Sweatman like, I've got you now, because he uses the term that Gobekli Tepe is commonly associated with and then says, I decoded these symbols, so I decoded the origins of civilization. It's, it, it, yes, it's hyperbole to sell a fucking book, man. It's not, it's not done to, like, I am the ultimate academic in the world, but, you know... I, I will give you this, that most archaeoastronomers will recognize that being so blatant with their findings and saying, I think that this means blah, does invite the kinds of slings and arrows that Dr. Sweatman is currently experiencing. Beyond that, I don't think he did a damn thing wrong in that paper. I mean, there's a couple of minor errors that have been pointed out and corrected over the years, but by and large, he followed great methodology. So we wrote this paper, Decoding Gebekli Tepe with Archaeoastronomy, what does the fox say? I've read the paper in preparation for this video, and so I'll use it to clarify the statements that he makes in his videos when necessary. I also wrote to Dr. Sweatman with clarification questions, which he graciously answered. I should make it clear right off the bat that the thesis of the paper is not simply that the images at Gobekli Tepe merely represent the sky on a specific date, but that they make reference to a comet impact that Dr. Swetman and his colleague Demetrios Tsikritsis believe occurred around 10,950 BCE. The ruins of Gobekli Tepe have been carbon dated to 9,600 to 8,000 BCE, which is at least a thousand years later than that. So if the pillar records the event, it would suggest the inhabitants of the area still remembered it after a millennium. That's a bit difficult to imagine. Oh yeah, imagine a rock coming from the sky and wiping out a civilization. I don't think that people would ever think of that and it would never be spoken of again, right? I mean, we have all kinds of myths that we, we attribute to all kinds of weird things. Look at the history of the Greeks, Mr. Biblical Archaeologist. I'm sure you're well aware of the history of the Greeks and, and how intertwined it is with the myth of Troy and... and, and, and you can imagine, one can imagine, like, some some of this being true and some of this being crap and it all getting twisted together, but there being this memory here that is w much older than the Greek civilization, right? And it was passed on for a very long time. Look at oral traditions all around the world. They are frequently convoluted and hard to discern, but they frequently also contain very old facts, Right? How is it crazy to imagine a comet that smacks the earth and just destroys an entire civilization or even one group of people that is like smart, however you want to look at it, something that is so bad that it just smites the planet. How the hell is people remembering that a thousand years later crazy? All right. That, to me, that's an, it, it would be insane to expect them not to. If we compare the knowledge of other ancient societies, even ones that had writing, and this one did not, they don't remember events a thousand years earlier very well at all. You should also know that the comet impact hypothesis itself is controversial. For our purposes, we're focusing specifically on whether the zodiac, that is, the zodiac whose origins we were able to trace firmly only to about 500 BCE in Babylonia, existed here thousands of years earlier. I'm not going to repeat everything I said in my previous video here, but there's a link to it, and there's a thumbnail thing, plug, 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 and um, here's the deal. When it comes to the zodiac, it's laid out along the ecliptic. That is the apparent path of the sun over the years. So when you have these constellations that look nothing at all like what they're supposed to, that's why. They were just chosen because they occupied one twelfth of the sky. The, the, the zodiac is, is old, and if you have one piece of it, you can almost guarantee you have twelve. Now, the animals may be different. The symbols may well be different. They're probably going to be attached to whatever religion it has that was the origin place and however long culture has been able to maintain that touchstone. But the bottom line is that... That convention of chopping the sky into 12 pieces to measure it is super duper old. And to, to claim, well, we don't know what asterisms that they used back then, who gives a flying fuck if we have an idea that they chopped the sky into 12 pieces? And 
we have one asterism to build off of. Now, I know that sounds like craziness if you don't know how archaeoastronomy works, but if you have an idea of how archaeoastronomy works, you're like, damn, we have a full asterism to work off of? That's awesome. Actually, not specifically the zodiac, but the entire Greek set of 48 constellations, which we established last time to have been subsequent to the Babylonian system. So this too is controversial. Okay, so either Dr. Miano is really being dishonest here or he's really not very good at this stuff at all. And I'm going to go with the latter because, as I've already demonstrated, he doesn't even know who belongs in the archaeoastronomy camp. He thinks that it's only archaeologists and astronomers and not mathematicians, when in reality, it's almost all mathematicians and then archaeologists and astronomers on the side. <laughs> but he would know that if he did rudimentary research, so I, I will assume that he did not. So the idea that you'd need all 48 of these asterisms in order to have one or two of them is absurd. Furthermore, there's a few constellations that are generally accepted to have existed for a very long time, and that's based on brightness of the stars and position in the sky. But this can be expanded to many others, and the arguments have gone back and forth as to which constellations have been around for a very long time with different patterns and different stars even sometimes incorporated. But to give you a very clear example, if you look at Orion, you can see the three stars in its belt. I don't think many people would have a problem lining that up and saying, okay, they've probably been looking at that shit for a long time. Then you can see the two shoulder stars, right? And the two stars for the knees, right? And you can see how that would also be an hourglass. You also can see that depicted in Native American art. That same hourglass symbol depicted as a man. So it's like it spread across. There, I highly doubt the Native Americans and the Greeks had the exact same astronomical charts. But they still saw Orion as a man, according to my mind, based on looking at that. And there's a reason for that. All right, Our eyes look at these things and they all like want to form the same things. That pareidolia that everybody uses to debunk this shit? That, no, 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 no. We're trying to discern how the ancients looked at it. You don't think they were susceptible to pareidolia too? This is where, this is just so, sorry. We won't, at least in this video, be going too far into the comet impact hypothesis, only as far as necessary to discuss the Greek constellation issue. So what did we say in this paper? We focused on pillar 43. That's the, the key to understanding Gebeki Tepe, and therefore the key to understanding the origin of civilization. I've been following um, developments of Gebeki Tepe since it was made public in about 2005, but I was none the wiser, until I read Graham Hancock's book, Magicians of the Gods. I didn't know until I saw this that the germ of Dr. Swetman's idea originated with Graham Hancock. It turns out that Dr. Swetman is a big fan of alternative history and lost high technology, and this interest preceded his work on the subject. So it would seem his efforts were intended from the beginning to establish the truth of lost advanced civilization. This is not to say that I think this makes him automatically wrong. Oh no, as I said, I think it's perfectly feasible for the animals on the pillars to represent constellations. I bring this up only so that you know that he has a horse in the race. In fact, in the paper, he and Sigritsis say at the outset that their hypothesis about the contents of the Gobekli Tepe pillars may be just the written confirmation of the comet impact that the comet impact theory needs. The only problem is what we end up with is several controversial hypotheses being used to support another controversial hypothesis. So we got a couple things to unpack here. Number one, I don't care where the idea came from and neither should you, Dr. Miano. You know, like to give an extreme example, Sir Isaac Newton also believed in alchemy in addition to all of his great scientific discoveries. And so if you were to imagine him in the modern day on social media, he would be getting drug like a freaking dog. And all of his other ideas may well be discarded because he believed in this one goofy thing, right? This is the problem with attacking the germ of the idea from the personality it came from. And despite Dr. Miano saying, well, it doesn't mean it's wrong or blah, blah, blah. He chose to mention it in the video. Why did he chose to include it and talk about it in the video? Why was that a decision that was made? We know why. It was his attempt to undermine every... Oh, this is a Graham Hancock thing. <laughs> we all know what that means. But there's one other thing that's worth mentioning here that Dr. Miano doesn't bother to mention, and that's 
every single time a spade is turned or a paper is published in the archaeological sphere, it has a agenda attached to it. Okay, we have Clovis first and those people. We have people that are trying. If you don't go digging in the ground, no. How? When do they dig it? Go back, Lee Tepe. When they found the stuff that was there under the ground, or did they just go dig there before anybody discovered anything? Of course, there had to be a discovery first. There's, without something to look at, nobody's gonna look. So without an uh, idea, without a hypothesis. I mean, what's a basic fucking scientific method, man? You make an observation. There's something there, so we got to look at it. And then you form a hypothesis. I think this may be a Roman site. And then you go investigate your hypothesis and test it. So, by that metric, everybody has a dog in this fight. So this criticism Dr. Miano just made here? Yeah, it's based on the people watching his video not really understanding the scientific method. In his book, he suggested that the vulture or eagle symbol here represents the constellation Sagittarius, and that this scorpion symbol represents constellation Scorpius, and that this bending bird symbol with down wriggling fish might represent the constellation Ophiuchus, although it's not quite in the right position. Uh, and that set of correspondences or correlations looked intriguing to me. I thought there could be something to it. Since his hypothesis is a revision of Graham Hancock's, he begins with Graham Hancock's identifications. He hasn't said it here yet, but the circular object that the vulture is holding with its wing, he identifies as the sun. But the archaeologists who examined the pillar have identified this as a decapitated head. And below you can see the body without the head. The sun is unlikely to have been represented by a human head. And it seems to me to be an integral part of the bird symbol rather than a separate symbol. In other words, the vulture is holding the head with its wing. And there's a couple things worth pointing out here too. Number one, just because it may be a depiction of that body's head um, doesn't mean that it also precludes it from being a depiction of the sun. As a matter of fact, it would actually be quite possible if that body was supposed to be some sort of deified individual or hero or maybe a ancient civilization that they thought was like really great and uh, that body that's dying there you didn't mention it's a massive boner i noticed it because it reminded me of myself but the thing is is that symbolism of a dying thing with the symbolism of rebirth if you don't see how that could potentially be tied into the whole idea of a lost civilization being smote upon by a rock from the sky, but being reborn here at Gobekli Tepe, well, maybe you're in the wrong line of work. Or maybe I'm just crazy. Now, the other thing worth pointing out is that skull has no face. It, it, it's just a round ball. And... Um, it's sitting right next to a vulture that has a face. Hell, it's got almost an expression. It almost seems to be smirking, right? I mean, and there's a scorpion there, and it, it's got, like, you know, it's got some detail, and there's all these other shit on this thing. But, but that human head has no detail? All right. So there's a skull cult there. Apparently, there's evidence for a skull cult. And so that's what you're going to hang your hat on here. So I will say maybe it's possible that... You know, that yeah, head, if they, they didn't want to show the skull, they, won't, don't, they don't want to depict the human head. That's a possibility. I'll go with that. But probably the best example of all is one from Gobekli Tepe itself, where we see, yes, a vulture, and just above its wing, a human head. Oh, so they didn't have some religious reason for not depicting the facial features. So that's not a human head, man. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. If they're going to depict a human head like that at Gobekli Tepe, I don't see why they would depict another human head without features. And again, look at all this symbolism here. Do you think vultures really went after a bunch of headless humans unless they were like killing people and leaving their bodies there? So, I mean, maybe that's a symbol of battle or something, right? Maybe this is like some old ancient war relic. But there's also the possibility that this is like some religious symbolism, right? Some like spiritual thing, like intertwined from the astronomy part of it to like these religious beliefs and the spirity stuff. I'm sure as a biblical archaeologist that you've heard a little bit about you know, 
religion being intertwined with like more mundane things and people like extrapolating into some crazy stuff. I, I, I've mentioned it before. It's an idea called sympathetic magic. It's pretty basic to shamanism or old school religion. Now, I'm not nitpicking when I dispute the identification of this image as the sun. This is important because Dr. Swetman believes that the positions of the symbols should be judged according to the relationship to the sun. It absolutely must be the sun for his hypothesis to stand, because if it's not, he loses his stellar orientation. Now, you guys that have been following me for a while know that I'm pretty contrarian when it comes to a lot of things. I'm definitely going to step in and uh, ask questions, and uh, I've got to uh, point out something right here. I'm not hearing the exact same words that Dr. Miano is saying. I'm hearing more of, I absolutely have to demonstrate that this is in fact not the sun, even if I have to attribute it to a skull because one or two other dudes did, even though there's no face on the damn thing, even though it's a human head and there's a far greater chance of a human being portrayed with features on its face than there is a vulture right next to it that has features on its goddamn face. That's what I heard. I mean, I'm, I, I could be extrapolating a tiny bit. As for the other animals, the only one of these that matches with a known symbol of a classical constellation is the scorpion as Scorpius in the bottom panel underneath the dividing line. It's a shame that part of Pillar 43 is covered up on the one side and also at the bottom on all the photos we find on the internet, at least as far as I've seen. I plan to visit there someday soon to see if I can get a better look. In the meantime, I would say our picture is both literally and metaphorically incomplete. If this is a star map recording a date, then it's essential that we know what all the symbols are. Now, for a biblical archaeologist to say this, it kind of betrays this wholehearted attack, attack, attack mode that his brain's in. You're saying we can't decode a stone if we don't know what all of it is? How about that Rosetta Stone? What percentage of that do we have? Well, I'll put the number up there because I can't be fucked to look at it when I'm talking to the camera. Uh, we translated three languages, like put the hieroglyphs of the Egyptians together because there was three languages on there, right? But we need all of it in order to work. This is... And this is not the only example. All throughout history, all throughout the history of archaeology, we find little pieces of fragments of things. How many bones does fucking paleontology pull out and grab two teeth and a thumb and build a skeleton? How? Come on, man. Just, for a scientist to be like this, this is the kind of shit that I would expect to hear in a church. Anyway, the scorpion symbol matches with the Babylonian and Greek symbol for Scorpius. So I would say, if this is a constellation, interpreting it as Scorpius is entirely reasonable. The other identifications he makes do not match known symbols for constellations. Having precedence would make his case stronger. There are a number of avian constellations Dr. Swetman could have chosen to associate with these bird symbols. Cygnus, Corvus, Aquila, Pisces which was a swallow in Babylon, but instead he associates them with constellations for which there is no evidence they were ever represented as birds. Now, before you object, I realized that in his view, the symbols have to be associated with constellations that are in those positions in the sky, but they don't have to be. It's possible that these can be constellations without this being a map. It could have conceptual rather than spatial significance. I think it's important to make that point. We could interpret these symbols by where they are situated on the pillar, or we can interpret them according to what is being depicted. Is one approach superior to the other? My inclination is to think the latter is superior, simply because in this time period, we already have evidence for conceptual imagery, but we don't already have evidence that anyone was making star maps or recording dates by constellations. We see that Dr. Miano does not understand the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy. You see, there's a reason that there's a mathematicians over and over and over again, specifically ones that are very good at statistical analysis and things like theoretical physicists, guys that model reality based on numbers, because it is difficult to know what ancient people thought. So they have a standard that the archaeoastronomy community uses. If I may read from a paper published by mathematicians from a 
math, math, maths. It is in this context that analogy plays a role in archaeoastronomy. A military metaphor is especially fitting here. Starting from the available evidence, the research strategy is to identify a bridgehead that links some observed feature of the civilization under study with those of a more familiar culture. Such link may be provided by similarities in the respective material artifacts or buildings, by evidence of common religious forms and cultural practices, or by considerations of historical and geographical continuity. Once an adequate bridgehead is available, the remaining work consists in a transfer of the system of meanings of the familiar culture into the description of the target civilization, revising and filling those aspects of the source culture that are either inapplicable or missing. In this way, an analogy with a more familiar civilization can become a source of new insights and hypotheses about a people whose intentions and worldview would otherwise entirely escape us. So to put this in layman's terms, the basic methodology of archaeoastronomy is to find a bridgehead or a touchstone or a one point that you can identify, that you can readily say this makes sense. And then you build your case from there and then you use math to whittle out the bullshit. This is how it's been done since the 70s. This is how it will probably continue to be done for all of my life and probably most of yours too, you youngins. The reality of it is, is this is how it works. And this is why they bring in these mathematicians over and over and over again. And we don't see so many archaeologists on board with this. I mean, not on board. We don't see so many of them championing the papers because it's not their cup of tea, man. This is, this is the realm of the hardcore mathematician, the good mathematician. It's above my pay grade. I dare say... It's above Dr. Miano's pay grade, spoiler to a future video. But it's important to point out here, Dr. Sweatman has Scorpio and the Sun to pull from. He can basically triangulate his other constellations from there. These both make sense based on what we're looking at. But being the scientist that he is, Dr. Sweatman prefers an interpretation that can be statistically calculated, and my approach would not allow for that. Uh, if only the human psyche could be understood mathematically, attaining knowledge would be so much easier. Now, Dr. Miano, I am just a lowly electrician. I'm a brick stacker and a wire puller. What do I know about real science? But it does seem to me that the stuff that you just espoused was basically his null hypothesis, which it seems he did account for. Obviously, it's not convincing as it is, because with only three symbols that match to three constellations, that could easily be a coincidence. He's not clear about this in the video, but when he says they match, he means the lines and points of the constellation matched the animal symbol. And yes, they could easily be a coincidence, but when I look at them, I'm not even seeing clear matches. The problem with this exercise is how subjective it is. This part is far from scientific, as Dr. Sweatman basically admits. The fact is, the lines of the constellations are not ancient. They're merely assumed. No ancient document preserves them, so why we're using them, I don't know. All we can say is that the ancient Greeks saw this configuration of stars and saw a centaur with a bow and arrow. We have a basic idea of what part of it was what, but they never gave us lines. And now if Dr. Sweatman wants to change it from a centaur to a vulture, He's at liberty to change the lines between the stars however he likes. And I could too, to make it match with pretty much any animal I would like. No, I'm not even trying to be an asshole here, but this is why people who don't know shit about this stuff shouldn't weigh in on it. Look, a combination of stars in the sky that is like a chunk of stars that you look at and you see, these serve navigational purposes, these serve timekeeping purposes, these serve season identifying purposes, these served all kinds of goofy bullshit purposes over the eons, right? So the lines might change a little bit, but when you have one or two big boy stars, you're going to have like all these other ones that are around it may or may not look at Orion. Once again, we'll mention that one. There's basically seven stars that are like definitely Orion. Eight, if you count the head. After that, you start veering off into, oh, is that part of Orion or not? And after you get to about 12 or 15 stars, you're like, fucking, I don't know. Are we even talking about Orion anymore? Or are we off into some other constellations altogether? Because these things weren't made to depict pictures in the fucking sky this is how we passed them along and we remembered them in layman's terms 
the esoteric knowledge, the people that were in the know since day fucking one of measuring this shit, since the first time they figured out what was going on with the solstices and the equinoxes and the different constellations in the sky, the different chunks of sky that the sun would rise into, the moon would rise into, all this shit. Since humanity first started measuring that, there has been chunks of the sky that have been identified with certain things, with certain ideas for a very long time. And you can't can't really go back to a time of written knowledge and not see them show up, can you? There's another problem. There are animals that are depicted on the various pillars in different ways, that is, facing in different directions or different body positions. That rules out the possibility that their design is meant to match a constellation. So trying to match them to the points and lines of a constellation is a fruitless endeavor. So Dr. Sweatman's hypothesis is Pillar 43 is the clock. It's the star map and all the other symbolism around there is peripheral, is symbolic by comparison, right? There is a difference between the symbol of Scorpio on an astronomical chart and the symbol of Scorpio on a necklace, on a crystal, around some hippie's neck. One is meant to actually, like, tell you something data-wise. One is an artistic symbol. The fact that a PhD-wielding academic needs this explained to him tells me that he either knows fuck all about archaeoastronomy or is completely misrepresenting Dr. Sweatman. I am going to go with option A. I think an approach that would give us more confidence is simply to match the known constellations with the known symbology. He does that with the scorpion, and that's the most convincing, right? I think we'd all agree. But the other three identifications he provides don't match the known symbology, And that for me is a problem. Why? Because if you want to argue for the existence of the classical constellations in this time period and in this region, and I said this in my previous video, then the more matching symbols you have, the stronger your case. But he only has one so far. And if I recall, he'll provide only one more example. Without matching symbols, there's no way to verify that the classical asterisms existed here. Well, yes, sure. It would be nice if we could match all the asterisms to every constellation that we ever had. And it would be great if we could just do that with everything else. If, if the Greeks used the same language as us, it would be even easier. We could translate everything great. and We wouldn't have needed that before I mentioned Rosetta Stone if the Egyptians would have done the same damn thing. What was their problem anyway? I mean, come on, man. We're talking about over 10,000 years ago, we've got one constellation that he's building a case off of. As I've mentioned, this is standard operating procedure in archaeoastronomy is for them to grab a beachhead, a touchstone, and build off of that if we know nothing about the culture. This is SOP. This isn't like Dr. Sweatman's out in the weeds somewhere. He's doing exactly how this shit's been done for a very long time. You're saying that he's only got two points in the sky that he can talk about with any certainty being Scorpio and Lupus, but in reality he also has the sun, which I'm sorry, but holding up a skull colt and pointing out a head that's got a face on it and saying this round ball is there for a head with the face when it actually closely more closely resembles the sun and right below it we have a symbol that we know has been used for astronomical purposes for a very fucking long time. You, you literally have to put blinders on at certain points when you're looking at this data in order to see what Dr. Miano sees. The people of Gobekli Tepe, if they had constellations, could very well have had different constellations, different star arrangements. And if you remember in my last video, I showed you how it took a long time for the catalog of classical constellations to develop. At least two separate systems were combined by the Greeks, and that was long after the time of Gobekli Tepe. We know they got some of their constellations from the Babylonians, and we know they got other constellations from somewhere else, not from the Babylonians. So the claim that the full Greek catalog existed this far back is anachronistic. The positions of the constellations are only significant if we have the correct constellation set. But, albeit unlikely, let's continue with the assumptions Dr. Sweatman is making. So, of course, to some degree, things are going to be a little bit different, which is why they use 
robust mathematics of the type that they use to discern what's going on on the other end of the fucking universe in order to discern what's going on here. Because it's hard to see what's going on in the minds of other men. But it's not impossible. The whole entire field of psychology is based around that. Are you going to tell me the entire field of psychology is bullshit too? Okay, using mathematics to grab things that we know people looked at across the world and say there's a really good chance that this showed up in this rock here and then extrapolating from that this is not novel this is not insane and and Dr. Miano should be aware of this but sadly I don't think he really was I think that by the, when he researched this video I think that he really didn't research it at all that he just like looked at the papers and the videos and he was just like this is a bunch of bullshit like everybody else that basically that I reviewed that looked at it so far at least Dr. Miano recognized it was peer reviewed but pretty much everybody just dismisses this and the reality of it is is the mathematics is that, that bore this out is above most of our heads and I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to dismiss that when we get to that point, we'll talk about it. But I'm saying that it's, it, it, what I'm saying is Dr. Miano is about as well equipped as I am to kick at the tires on the math on this paper. Neither one of us knows fuck all compared to Dr. Sweatman when it comes to this level of mathematics. Assuming that the people of Gobekli Tepe had a set of constellations closely resembling that of the Greeks from thousands of years later, and assuming that the arrangement on the pillar is representing the arrangement of the constellations in the sky, and assuming that the circle on the vulture's wing is the sun and not a head, or part of the vulture image, then yes, Sagittarius is in the right spot, but Ophiuchus is not. And then we got the problem of orientation. Scorpius is facing in the wrong direction. Now, in the paper, they make the point that, quote, it is possible the artists of Pillar 43 did not intend to depict an accurate star map of the sky, rather their intention was perhaps to provide a symbolic representation of the order and approximate placement of the constellations as they saw it, sufficient to enable interpretation of Pillar 43." Unquote. That may be true, but when the placement of the constellations is a key support for your identifications, imprecision weakens your case. What concerns me is that he is giving himself considerable wiggle room before doing a statistical probability analysis, making it more difficult for his hypothesis to be falsified. So normally the face of archaeoastronomy is stellar alignments, right? So not really the interpretation of like an artifact like this stone here and, and, and boring it out. But this is actually something that archaeoastronomy frequently does. It's just not what is talked about all the time. So when they discuss like finding multiple orientations, they talk about how having multiple edifices, multiple buildings pointing the same direction is actually a crucial part of bearing that out when you have a large structure, say like Gobekli Tepe, which they do, by the way, believe has some astronomical alignments. Link in the description, which would also support Dr. Sweatman's case that the stones there are some sort of star map, or at least that one in particular. And while the imprecision may weaken Dr. Sweatman's case, the reality of it is, as the paper that I cited earlier talks about having a bridgehead, he does have a solid one in the case of Scorpio and the Sun. And by using those and extrapolating and putting other things together, and when they start falling into place, it, when, when Sagittarius, as the vulture, falls into place, for example, other ones that are slightly off or slightly oriented in the wrong direction or completely oriented in the wrong direction with, with Scorpio we'll talk about in a minute um this this doesn't completely destroy what he's talking about here it, again there is going to be religious symbolism that is poured over into this it's not going to be just strictly science these people didn't have a concept of science like we do nowadays it, they, they had it was all one right that uh, uh sympathetic magic I talk about all the time it was part of their worldview and it wasn't something detached from reality where it's like, oh, this guy believes in Wu. It's like they all believed in Wu. All right. That's just how it was. So 
to see some degree of symbolism showing up into this stuff does make sense. And again, when he makes that prediction and he's like, okay, we have these two symbols together, so I think we're going to see this one there, and oh my God, there it is. That Right off the bat, man, for archaeoastronomy, that's a pretty good fucking leap right there. And then you get the uh, super maths that we'll have on the second video we talk about that really bears this out. But of course, Dr. Miano is not even equipped to handle that, which is why we're talking about it on YouTube instead of in an academic journal where electricians like me are just forced to watch on the sidelines. That'll teach you, Dr. Miano. Now you've got to deal with my hairy ass. So far, just two constellations match in their positions in relation to the sun. However, starting from that idea, I was able to go much further and decode the rest of the animal symbols of the Beketepi. So, for instance, this duck or goose symbol at the bottom of pillar 43 looks rather like constellation Libra. This dog or wolf symbol looks rather like constellation Lupus. And they're all in approximately the right position. Okay, so he says, upon these numerous assumptions, he has the confidence to build further. Lupus, as a dog or wolf, is credible, as it was one of the 48 constellations we inherited from the classical world, and it was represented as a wolf. It can also be traced back to Babylon. The only thing is, this doesn't look like a wolf to me. In fact, when we compare it to the other foxes at Gobekli Tepe, this seems to confirm that it's a fox. For his purposes, it doesn't matter, because he's not making an effort to match the classical symbols. But for us, it should matter. As for Libra, I'd be willing to bet that most people would not, in fact, think of a goose when they looked at Libra. And even in his paper, he admits the constellation doesn't really look like a goose. I suspect he's identifying it with Libra, not because the points and lines match, but because it's in the right position. But if you saw my last video, you would already know that Libra was invented as its own constellation only after it was separated from Scorpius. There's no sign of Libra's existence as a separate constellation in Mesopotamian astronomy before the second millennium BCE. It's highly improbable it would have existed as a separate constellation this far back. And if it were placed properly, it would be at the scorpion's claws, not at the scorpion's tail. And once again, Dr. Miano betrays his lack of knowledge when it comes to this stuff. First of all, let's talk about lupus here. Yes, a fox is a perfectly great substitute for a dog or a wolf, especially when you talk about cultural diffusion over the course of 10,000 plus years. Don't be silly. Yeah, Libra it was originally the claws of Scorpius, right? So originally it would have been at Scorpion's front. So why is Libra this other thing at the tail of Scorpio? That doesn't make a lot of sense if you consider all that right except for maybe maybe in the olden days scorpio was turned around that's why the claws were actually considered to be part of libra because if you look at it now where it stretches out and it starts to form those claws that could have been the ass end of the scorpion and the tail could have wound up and around and my point is is that you could have had this scorpion Libra constellation combination change over millennia and the ultimate thing is as I've mentioned before and which shows your pedestrian view on this stuff as I've mentioned before this is a zodiac it's a timepiece so if you have three constellations or two constellations or one even you're probably going to have four because it's a timepiece and any culture that can recognize a solstice can recognize both solstices and if they can recognize those that can also recognize the equinoxes and there are your four cardinal points on a clock and let me let me get something out of the way here as far as that goes. You just, we, we, people pick up me about this broken clock every now and again, but, but I've mentioned this before. Look at the symbols on the thing. We have a handful of symbols you can recognize, and most of y'all don't know what the fuck a memory stick duo is or a PSP battery looks like. But they're there depicted as numbers on my clock. And you know what? I know what numbers they are, not just because I can count them, but because the symbol of the clock is ingrained in my mind. So you could actually take these symbols and completely omit them and just put those four up there as we've all seen done before and still it would work in my brain because I know what that fucking entire symbol, that entire mechanism of time is. So to extrapolate the clock metaphor straight to pillar 43, 
we have some things that we completely recognize, like the sun or uh, Scorpius, and we have other things that we don't completely recognize, but we can pretty much extrapolate from based on their position and based on a few other things, like your memory stick duo or your battery. Moreover, what about the other symbols that are here? What can they tell us? If we look at the bottom of the pillar, there is this headless man. What does that mean? Presumably that has something to do with death. It might. Did you know that around this time, people often buried their dead without heads? Yeah, it was a customary part of their funerary rites and probably had spiritual significance. Since this practice was contemporary and local, this image could very well be connected with this practice. There's evidence of a skull cult at Gobekli Tepe, and I'll leave an article discussing the evidence in the description below the video for you to check out. But Dr. Swetman doesn't make this connection. Instead, he interprets it as a reference to a catastrophe more than a thousand years removed from Gobekli Tepe. When he puts everything else together and is able to come up with some sort of date based on the clock that he claims Pillar 43 is, well, yes, he does actually say that this has to do with people being smote upon by a rock from the sky. And this is the part where I would say Dr. Sweatman kind of whipped it out of his pants a little bit too far. But in all honesty, I can't blame him. It's just this is the kind of thing most modern archaeoastronomers kind of roll back because they don't want to get the slings and arrows that Dr. Miano is throwing at him right now. And so because of that, most of those guys wouldn't go this far, but they still would think this far. Okay. What Dr. Sweatman here has done isn't, isn't anything out of the ordinary or crazy. And then there are these strange handbag symbols. What could they be? And what are the animal symbols next to them? Well, we proposed that these handbag symbols actually represent the other three solstices and equinoxes for the year. So if this is one of them, if this is representing the position of the sun on one of the solstices or equinoxes, Perhaps these are representing the other three solstices and equinoxes. And in fact, rather than being handbags, you can imagine this is actually a picture of the sun on the horizon. So that makes quite good sense. And therefore, these tiny animal symbols are perhaps the constellations corresponding to the other solstices and equinoxes at this time. Okay, the amount of speculation is increasing. We've gone from proposing that the animals may symbolize constellations to specific animals representing specific constellations, without precedent in most cases, to a headless corpse representing a catastrophe from long before the time of Gobekli Tepe, to these symbols here representing three out of four solstices and equinoxes. I can certainly understand a semicircle positioned at a horizon as a reasonable interpretation of the sun, but this isn't a neat fit, is it? The suns on these images don't look anything like the image of the sun Dr. Sweatman identified here. They're hollow. They would have been easier to carve solid. And why is the horizon a rectangle? Is that an intuitive way to draw a horizon? And what about a rising sun indicates that it's a solstice or equinox? Nothing. The number of assumptions being made here are already too many to reliably hold up a theory. And there are more to come. And each proposal relies on the veracity of the previous one. Oh, we're going to do a little recap here? <laughs> All right, let's do a little recap. So we have Dr. Sweatman's bridgehead, or touchstone to another culture that we know of, and that would be the constellation Scorpio. We also have the sun, as he posits. Now, Dr. Miano wants to claim that that sun is a skull, but I'm going to point out to you that we have the no facial features, and we do see skulls, human heads, depicted with facial features, so... I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's probably not an accurate way of interpreting this. We have Dr. Sweatman claiming these other animals are other asterisms, and he points out how it would be a time clock piece thing of uh, using the Zodiac, kind of old school version of it. He uses the handbags for the other three equinoctial markers or solstices. So you have your four pieces of the time piece, like I basically pointed out before, the big one being shown right there on the pillar itself, and then the three handbags in the top being the other three cardinal points, right? And then Dr. Miano wants to challenge that by saying that you wouldn't draw a horizon that way and that the suns shouldn't be hollow, which is really kind of missing out as far as I'm concerned. But more than that, it's he is just attacking the fact that there's all these assertions on top of assertions, but 
Again, this is how archaeoastronomy is done, and this is why they bring in hardcore mathematicians and not just an archaeologist to come in there with this calculator and a slide rule, because it takes some real complicated theoretical maths to weigh this stuff out. Which is why I tend to take it more seriously than a lot of people do who think that you don't have any credentials to do it if you're a mathematician. So that's a nice idea, but what is precession of the equinoxes? And how can it be used to represent a date? Well, you know that the Earth rotates on its axis, does that once a day, but that axis of rotation itself precesses over the course of about 26,000 years. Yes, axial precession is the Earth's wobble on its axis, so to speak, which is caused by gravitational forces, and it's a slow wobble. One wobble is approximately 26,000 years long. What this means is that the Earth's position in its orbit around the Sun changes over time, coming back to where it started after 26,000 years. From our point of view here on Earth, the background of stars in the sky behind the Sun slowly moves. Is it possible to record a date by showing the constellations at the time of an equinox or solstice? No. Precession cannot be used either to represent a date or calculate one. Why? Because it isn't precise. You can't record an accurate date by the position of constellations because it takes such a long time for the arrangement of stars to change. I suppose precession could be used to guesstimate, but you couldn't even get it right to within the lifetime of a nation, much less to within a generation. Even in the case of an approximate date, knowledge of precession wouldn't be needed to record it because all you would need to know is what constellations were in the sky on that date. And even if you were recording a date during which time the arrangement of constellations was different than your own time, all you would need to have is the information passed down to you. Not the information about precession, just the information about the arrangement of constellations. And for as small as that clip is, it has a shitload of wrong in it. Let's unpack some of it. Let's start with, you can't make an accurate clock out of precession of the equinoxes. Um, the dude who designed Hoover Dam, Bill Begg to Differ, he put a star map there that was intended to let people know when the damn thing was built. And I bring this up all the time because it's a very real world, very modern example of exactly what we're talking about with these kinds of things. It's an effing star map that's used to tell you what time the structure was built, and it's pretty damn accurate, and it uses precession of the equinoxes. So, once again, it, this is like an area where Dr. Miano just does not know what he's talking about. Number two, yes, you cannot tell an accurate date with precession of the equinoxes if you just go by the symbol, but you'll notice that he's got Sagittarius, or the vulture in this case, holding the sun, and it's in a very specific position. That, that as Dr. Sweatman says, is going to be good for about 500 years. No, no, that's not super accurate, but that brings us to our third point. The lifetime of a nation is all the more accurate it is. When you're talking 10,000 years ago, what kind of margin of error do you have with carbon dating? Do you still use it? So if you go back 10,000 years and your carbon dating's got a 2 to 5% margin of error, you've got basically that same 500 years, right? Hmm. So why are you have a problem with one and not the other? Probably because you didn't actually think this through or do proper research like you usually do in your videos, which is kind of odd. But then again, it is somebody attacking archaeoastronomy. I'm not surprised that the person doing it has no idea what archaeoastronomy is even about and thinks that mathematicians don't even belong on the field. It's just archaeologists and astronomers. That's what it says on the tin. And then he tries to posit the notion that a group of people that had enough knowledge of the stars and constellations to make a star chart to tell people time in the future wouldn't necessarily have knowledge of precession of the equinoxes, which I don't even know what to say to that. This is the kind of thing that you would know about in the course of like five or ten generations tops of watching the night sky, they're going to notice precession of the equinoxes, especially when they're sharing this knowledge with like mythology and shit, right? Where it's like this spirity thing. As, as I've mentioned before, you can just imagine a father teaching his child, hey, so this time of day you're going to see the sun and the, the lion that's right there, he's going to eat that thing when it comes up. And this is a story about the lion and the sun fighting. And then five generations later, that story don't make sense anymore because the sun goes up the lion's butt now or whatever, right? So you have to... Of course they knew about precession of the equinoxes, Dr. Miano. For them not to, you may as well say they'd been watching the stars like two generations, and in which case they probably wouldn't have very many asterisms, and in which case this entire endeavor would be futile. Which is entirely a possible take on the thing. 
However, the existence of the scorpion, the existence of the sun with the thing that does look very similar to Sagittarius in that area, these are all like good signposts. And when he brings Lupus into it, you also have, you have that's a pretty goddamn good starting point for archaeoastronomy. For archaeoastronomy, actually, it's a great starting point. Advocates of lost high technology usually argue that the ancient people had less knowledge and capabilities than mainstream archaeology assumes. But in this case, Dr. Swetman has taken the opposite position. By attributing knowledge of precession to the people of Gobekli Tepe, he's assigning to them more knowledge than he would even give to later cultures. If he believes in the fringe idea that a comet impact wiped out an earlier advanced civilization and all the knowledge they had so that humans had to start all over again, wouldn't that place Gobekli Tepe early in that period of redevelopment? A thousand years after the impact is too early for them to have advanced that far in their knowledge and too late for them to have retained anything from the pre-impact period. And this is the kind of statement that I dare say would never be put up even for peer review because it's, it's absurd on its face, isn't it? I mean, a thousand years, as I just said, is plenty enough time to observe procession. You're going to see half of the change. The sun is going to go from going up the lion's mouth to up the lion's butt. You're going to fucking notice that. And the idea that that knowledge wouldn't be held on to just because it's word of mouth over a thousand years or something, this is very easily held on to knowledge. See how we're looking at the stars tonight? Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? But guess when I was a kid, it was a tiny bit different. And when you're an adult, it's going to be a tiny bit different. And that's just how this works. Boy, that would sure be something difficult to pass down. So it's like a wobbling top. Now that has observable consequences. It means that uh, if we look behind the sun, if we could see behind the sun, and see what constellation was there on the summer solstice today, we would see the constellation Gemini. But 11,000 years ago, if we were to do the same thing, we were to look at the sky behind the sun on the summer solstice, we would see the constellation Sagittarius, as shown on pillar 43. So the summer solstice constellation gradually um, rotates around this zodiac, and it's the same for the other uh, equinox constellations and the winter solstice. If you're wondering how the people would see the sun and the stars at the same time, at sunrise there's a short period where both can be observed. At this point we still haven't established yet that Sagittarius is on pillar 43, but even if we did, he has pointed to no evidence indicating the image featuring the vulture is a solstice or equinox. Now this is really hard for me to believe that Dr. Miano doesn't understand this given his video that he did right before this about how old the zodiac is. These cardinal points, this is where the sun rises on the solstices and the equinoxes were so important to the ancients all across the world that we see them. That's when that serpent crawls down the side of Kolkakan, right? And that's when Angkor Wat, when the sun casts the top of the temples. And that's when, where the Sphinx looks. It, it, this is something that all across the goddamn world you see this, these four cardinal points are important enough that they still get emulated in our clock today. I am confused as to how you could think that if they are demonstrating astrological symbols on the thing and they're trying to tell time with it, I'm confused as to why you would think those weren't sunsets and that that wouldn't be a solstice or an equinox. There is no reason to think otherwise. If you are looking at it from the perspective of that, if you're looking at it from, from the perspective of them marking time with their, even, even it's just like, we're going to celebrate this day. This is the day that Timmy lost his head to a vulture. When they put that date on the stone, there's no way for them to specifically mark that exact day, but they can mark the time of year, and they can mark the year probably within 500-ish with that exact thing that we've done there. You're talking about, oh, you can only mark this in the grasp of about 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years or whatever. The thing is, is even now we still call these ages, right? Like this is an astronomical age, and like the symbol for Jesus was a fish during the age of Pisces, right? I mean, it's, this, this, these things aren't exactly like uh, hidden. It, it's part of our culture. And we're now in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, right? All the hippies around the time I was born were singing about that shit. So this is, this stuff is important on 2000 year cycles. And for, for people that didn't have a specific calendar like we do, where they've written out number of days, but they did have ways to mark ages. This was the first sun, or the third sun, or the 
fifth son, like they talk about in the Mayan times, they may very well be talking about exactly this sort of thing. So my problem here is that this is like a, one of those zero benefit of the doubt type things that Dr. Miano is extremely notorious for, in my mind at this point. He just, he always gives the people he's looking at like the absolute worst possible benefit of the doubt, the, the least amount of charity when it comes to his opposition's perspective. So by writing down all four of the constellations corresponding to summer and winter uh, solstices and spring autumn equinoxes, you can write a date accurate to within about 500 years. So that's what we propose Pillar 43 represents. So he admits himself it's not an exact date. That would indicate that the makers of the pillar either had no idea how to record an exact date, did not have an exact date, or did not care what the exact date was. Since an astrological age is about 2,000 years long, then the date wouldn't actually be accurate to within 500 years, as he says. This configuration, which he affirms is approximate, existed for a good 1,200 years. If they simply were recording what they saw in the sky in their own time, which I think is a feasible idea, why does it have to be a date? Assuming it is a date, who are they recording it for? Future posterity? I find it very difficult to believe that they were recording a date for people a thousand years or more in the future. It's more reasonable to suppose they made these pillars for themselves. The idea of a Stone Age people making a time capsule seems very far-fetched to me. Doesn't it to you? And here we have a perfect example of Dr. Miano engaging in YouTube tactics instead of academia. I don't think that's a very good idea for him to do those kinds of things. Do you? that loaded question that he drops at the end there it's so manipulative and it's the kind of thing you can't put in a paper <laughs> but you can definitely do it on youtube especially when you've got comments like this down there this is the level of ignorance that he's his audience is portraying there look at this is the number two comment on that thing uh, and look at it it's it it's talking about they think that it that an open source journal means that any dipshit can post it and it's automatically reviewed and look, look at how many likes it gets the number two. Anyway, that, that, well, yeah, when you're preaching to those kinds of people, you can say boneheaded stuff and get away with it all day long, especially when it comes to archaeoastronomy, because it is a very highly un misunderstood field. There's not a lot of people that are into it. I'm one of the few people that are even in this community that's like talks about it a lot, right? I feel everybody's like, oh man, there's pyramid alignments and this, this stuff's cool. But I'm like, I, I, this this stuff is like interesting to me. It's actually intriguing because I recognize that it's not just putting something together and then just like p pinning it on the wall and saying, this is what I think. Now it's controversial and it's complicated, which is why these just kinds of shooting from the hip kind of, well, you know, I did some basic research on the Zodiac and now I'm going to complain about the shape of the horizon and say, well, this could be a skull cult and there's no way those two things could possibly be mingled together. And well, there's no way that these could have got these asterisms from anywhere, but the Greeks or whoever these island people were in Phoenicia or Malta, wherever the fuck you want to put it on today. And you make the silly claim that you can only tell it within about a thousand years because an astronomical age is 2000 years. So I guess you're just cutting that in half and guessing. I don't really know how you came up with that number given your reasoning here but I'll use some reasoning 71.6 years is one degree of change in that so if these guys anywhere put a stick in the ground that they went and stood on a piece of stone and they put a stick over there every time every solstice and equinox and all that shit and they watch the sun rise into it they would have this marked and they would know but when that stick didn't work in like three generations even back then when people died before they were my age <sighs> they would know something was up. It would take no time at all for them to figure that shit out. And because of that, with it having the, the sun inside of the wings the way it is, you actually have a very limited amount of time that you could actually say that that alignment would be accurate. A few years and a few degrees change and it would be outside the wing. So I, I just... The degree of ignorance and hubris and arrogance here just makes this like kind of grotesque in my opinion to be honest with you and I'll, I will respond to the rest of the video hopefully I can get through the entire rest of the video in my next response to this but we're definitely going to go through everything that Dr. Miano had to say in these things um Dr. Sweatman's paper is actually for those of you who have followed me for a while and expected me to just rip it a new one I'm sorry the paper is really good it, I, I highly suggest you look at it with a new set of eyes 
understand again, like he said that, um, like I said that it, Dr. Sweatman kind of whipped it out of his pants a little bit there, and and by by putting like younger Dryas impact hypothesis stuff on it, he basically it, it made it 110 percent sure that that paper was going to get attacked. But if you read the methodology, if you if you go look look at the links that I'm providing down below, look at the things that I've said so far about the the touchstone about a bridgehead. If you read the methodology that is used in standard archaeoastronomy, you'll see that what Dr. Sweatman here is like actually really robust. He really, really did a good job, and it's 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 crazy. He's using different maths than some of the other archaeoastronomers have. As far as I'm concerned, it seems to be novel, but it's also because he's a theoretical physicist, so he's really going hard at probability and at trying to model reality on something we can't exactly see based on a few observations that we can make. It's exactly what that job entails, but he's applying it in a different area. So it's cool to see the math brought to bear here. And even if after 20 years or 50 years or whatever, if everything there's proven to be completely wrong, at the very least, what Dr. Sweatman did here was advance the field of archaeoastronomy with that, with the equations that he used here. He's advanced the field of archaeoastronomy, in my opinion, by, by a fair margin. And the popularity of this paper hasn't hurt. Um, we'll get into the math some on the next video. But uh, anyway, I'm going to have to kind of call this one good here because otherwise it's going to be like 14 hours long. So I really appreciate everybody watching this far. Um, I really, really want to thank Dr. Sweatman for taking the time to communicate with me through all this thing. Um, I want to thank Dr. Miano for making such a great video for me to rip apart. The, the frosting is just mm, exquisite. And uh, I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to watch. Don't forget to click the bell and subscribe and like and all that stuff. Share it with your friends. Tell your grandma there's some guy over here talking about old rocks. Uncle Beckley Tepe, I'm sure she'll want to watch. Have a good day.